This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Okay, welcome. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here at uh, Unsiloed, uh, and my guest today is Jay Barney. Uh, Jay's a um, professor of strategy and business at uh, University of Utah, and he's previously been at Ohio State, he's been at UCLA, Texas A&M, a whole bunch of different places. Um, and uh, in addition to his really seminal research on strategy, particularly in the area of uh, kind of resource-based strategy, um, he's, he's written quite a few academic articles and a couple books. Um, he's written a, a book, a textbook, um, which is, uh, you know, I think one of the best textbooks in strategy out there. I've used it in my strategy class. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, highly recommended. Um, and uh, I know for some people, they think that, uh, you know, a textbook isn't, isn't really a book, you know, that you read for fun. I, I like reading textbooks for fun. I'll jump on a six hour flight to the East Coast and I'll I'll grab a textbook on uh, on strategy or structured finance, and you know it just makes those hours fly on by. But you know I'm a little weird, and so if you're not like me, and and you prefer like a more you know uh, a conventional narrative, uh, you might want to check out this book. I mean this is this is this is fantastic. It's it's called um, uh, What I Didn't Learn in Business School. It's it's a book uh, that Jay's co-author of, and it's it's a novel, uh, and it's it's a novel about the the um, experience it's about a it's about a management consultant on a, basically his first week at work i think first project uh yeah. and there, there's just not a lot of books out there on management consultants right um you know there's a few but but not a lot and and so for those of you who are trying to figure out what that's like you should check it out if you want to understand kind of like business strategy and it's for people who've actually studied business strategy it it, it it's for people who haven't but people who have because it makes a lot of reference to the literature and the, and the stuff that you learn in business school and why it needs to be augmented and supplemented. So it's, I, I definitely, definitely recommend it. So, uh, so welcome, Jay. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun to write the novel. A lot more fun to write the novel than to write the textbook, I have to admit. <laughs> well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll start with that because, you know, there are, um, there are not that many kind of books that I would think of as like novels slash textbooks. So there, in business, there's the goal. I think I, I'm sure you've, right. you've, read, you've read that. And, you know, that was... Sure. 20, 30 years ago. And then um, the Phoenix Project is another one that I really like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who thought you could write an exciting novel about DevOps, but, but they did it. And, <laughs> and so, you know, what, what inspired you to, uh, to, to write that kind of book? Uh, I wanted to write something for a general popular, uh, popular audience, a manager, not an academic book or a book primarily designed for students. Um, and uh, we met with several publishers and they said, what you need to do is you need to have a single concept that you can communicate in the title that will that you organize the entire book around. The, the problem with that is in my own work consulting with companies, the value added is not in your ability to have a single concept that works in all settings, because there is no such thing. Right. Rather to, to use my, the skills that I thought I brought to the table was a portfolio or a toolbox of theoretical perspectives, including some of my own work, but also others' work as well. And uh, so I didn't want to write a book that just had one tool. I wanted to really talk about the problem of, of how to integrate across multiple tools in the real world. So um, my co-author and I, uh, Trish Norman, and I um, what, we kept saying, what story should we say? What, how should we, what story do we want to pitch? And then finally, one of us said, why don't we just tell a story? And so that was really the beginning of that of the book, and uh, we worked on an outline for quite a while. We she was she had been a consultant in a major consulting firm. I had done a fair amount of consulting on my own, so we drew on our experience plus our academic uh, backgrounds uh, to write a book that is is both an introduction to the content of strategy because all the major tools that are covered in the textbook are actually used in the novel, but they're also um, they're put in a real organizational context where people have mixed motives and there's a backstory that you don't understand. And, and uh, it's fun. It's, it, I characterize it as a coming of age story where the, uh, our hero is uh, very smart, uh, but uh, reasonably naive, uh, recent uh, MBA graduate who thought that if he learned how to crack cases in the MBA program, that would make him a good organizational consultant. 
he had a lot to learn. And, uh, and so uh, uh, at the end, in the end, uh, the book ends with him saying, hey, and I still have a job. So <laughs> he was kind of surprised because he had some rocky moments, to say the least. Well, what I liked about the the book is that it, the narrative arc actually kind of follows the the kind of voyage of intellectual discovery that all of us who have been studying strategy yes. have been going through. I think since like the eighties, really. I mean, you know, he he starts off by doing a five forces analysis, right? Forces. right? Or you know, <laughs> you have the different characters kind of representing these different viewpoints and. And then, you know, then gradually he starts thinking about, you know, core competencies and then, and then he's right. like, well, you know, organizational structure matter. Oh, and then there's, you know, culture and incentives. And, <laughs> and, and so it's, it's, you know, when you do a, um, a strategy class for MBAs, I mean, you kind of, you kind of walk through those different frameworks and, and, and perspectives. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you, you realize that the, the truth of, of the situation, I mean, the, the really is, is a, it's kind of an amalgamation of these different different frameworks and, and perspectives, I, none of which is complete in and of themselves. And I thought, I but, thought that... But by definition, they can't be, because if they were, then there would be reality and they wouldn't be good theory. So it's not a surprise that they're incomplete. That's not a criticism. That's actually a strength of theory, because it has good, when it has the clear boundaries and when it can be applied and when it can't be applied. Yeah, now I think we were discussing before uh, we, we started that, um, you know, I, I was in, uh, I, I took my first strategy class in 1991 and um, it was actually just recently added to the MBA curriculum. It wasn't like you know, they had a year's worth of core classes and then all of a sudden people realized, hey, you know, there's this thing called strategy and, and you know, but, but nobody knew how to like. You know, there was no room in the core, so they just threw it in like the second year, and and sure, sure. and uh, they they didn't even call it strategy. I think they called it business policy. And um, yeah, that was the old name. Yeah, yeah, and it was really like a it was like an industrial organization course, really. And um, and 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 that was right at the time when your your key article came out, right back in. And there wasn't like SSRN or anything back in those no. days, so it was like you know when when an article came out, it was kind of like a a, a big deal, you know, and um. And and so uh, later on, I think ten years later, you you were reflecting on the, the, this article, and you you talked about positioning, right? Which is, of course, a, you know, strategy people think about positioning, and you said, well, how am I going to position this 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 key this new new perspective, this new framework? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could take us back in time a little bit, and and um, you know, to 1991 or so, and tell us a little bit, like, you know, what what were you thinking? Uh, how did you come up with the the the, the realization that that that, you know, this resource-based view of the firm is so important. You can maybe tell us a little bit about what that is and why it's important and, and why it was such a, a big deal at the time. Sure. Um, it actually, the story actually begins uh, in the early 80s. Um, I had joined UCLA, and uh, um, the actual event that began this whole process is, is very obscure. I... Um, I was a brand new assistant professor. I didn't know anything. And I, and I went to a colleague of mine who was in the finance department, a guy named Tom Copeland. Tom has since uh, left academia and spent a lot of time on the consulting world. And I asked Tom as a finance professor, he said, I'm a new organizations guy. Is there anything I should read? And he said, yeah, you should read this book, uh, this uh, almost a book, a paper by Jensen and Meckling in General Financial Economics. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I got that article. I'm, I'm still, I'm still surprised. I went to the they, library. I'm still waiting for those guys to win the, win the Nobel Prize, by the way. You okay, know, the, yeah, yeah, that's true. So anyway, I went to the library, got the article, and I read it quickly. And I went back to his office and said, this is what the paper's about. And he said, no, no, you don't understand it. So I figured I had one more chance. So I then spent the next six weeks reading that article. Um, and afterwards, um, I actually think I understood the article at least as well as the authors. Um, it took six weeks because each line implied a literature I didn't know anything about. So I'd read a sentence, especially the first third of the paper. And then I'd read 10 other papers to, to understand that sentence. And then the next sentence would create the same thing. And it took a long time. So then I went back to Tom's office and I said, this is what the article is about. He said, you're exactly right. So the article to me, uh, the article is mostly about agency theory, but that's not actually what was most critical for me. What was most critical for me was the concept of an efficient capital market. Um, and and um, that that has that that's was, the reason that's important is that an efficient capital market is is says that uh, all publicly available information about a firm's 
value of the firm's assets will be reflected in the price of those assets. There's a debate about whether that's true or not always, but as a theoretical position, it's very interesting. Um, I then wrote an, uh, I, I, and so I thought about those, that a lot. And at the same time, I, I, for the first time, I started teaching this strategy course. And so I thought I'd better read Michael Porter's book, Competitive Strategy. And I really did not like it. I really did. I, I, I actually, I still have the copy here in my uh, home library. And uh, I wrote really nasty things in the margin. I could kidded with him about that sense, of course. But, but I didn't know why I didn't like it. Uh, and so I, I went on this sort of personal journey to understand why I had such a visceral reaction. It turns out that the reason is that having gone through Jensen and Meckling and sort of understood efficiency, equilibrium arguments, I had become a Chicago school economist. And Porter, while he was applying economics to strategy questions, was applying structure, conduct, and performance, non-Chicago school. And those two don't work very well together. And so I had become a Chicago economist unknowingly and thus had this very negative reaction. So I wrote two papers to help me understand that, that this reaction. The first one uh, was initially titled Why Michael Porter is Wrong. Uh, I changed the title. Um, and it was written in 1984, published in 1986 in Management Science, and it's called Strategic Factor Markets. And basically what it does is it makes the argument that um, uh, the resources that a firm acquires in factor markets, these, these factors of production, that their price has an impact on your ability to generate profits in product markets. So if you pay the full value of the resources necessary to implement a strategy in the factor market, then even if, you look, if it looks like you've created competitive uh, imperfections in the product market, they will not be a source of profits because those com the profits that were generated in the product market would have been anticipated in the factor market. And then it says, well, but not all factor markets are perfectly competitive. And one of the reasons they're not perfectly competitive is that firms approach those markets with heterogeneous capabilities that make some of those resources more valuable to them than to others. That's the basis of resource-based theory. So that was in 1984, published in 86. The other paper I published in 80, uh, wrote in 84 became the published paper that I published in 1991. But it took a while, a long while, I had seven revisions uh, in multiple places to, before, before it got finally got published. And, and I always thought of it as a way of advertising the theory that was in the management science paper on strategic factor markets. But the result was uh, it, it actually has become the more cited of the paper. It's pretty accessible, pretty easy to read. But the basic story is it's, it's not about industry always. It can be in some circumstances. Firms are operating in oligopolies, you know, you probably need to understand positioning theory and SCP logic as a supply to strategy. But for those of us that are operating in more competitive environments, um, uh, the story says what you need to do is you need to look inside and identify resources and capabilities you already control that you have had because of history, because of relationships you've developed that are socially complex. You've had those relationships, that, those kinds of capabilities, then you have to find opportunities to gain access to new resources that are more valuable to you than they are to anyone else because you have these special capabilities. And, and in doing so, you can, uh, if, when you do that, you can avoid overpaying and you can take advantage when the price of the market doesn't fully reflect reflect the value of those resources to, that, that you can create with those resources. I, I'll give you a really simple example. Suppose there's a firm out there that, that's worth $10,000 as a standalone entity. We'll do an m &A. It works generally, but uh, $10,000 as a standalone entity. And there's three firms interested in buying that company. And each one of those firms, if they acquire it, takes something that's worth $10,000 and then generate $12,000 of value. It's a $2,000 synergy of some sort. But if capital markets are reasonably efficient and, uh, and these firms are not constrained in any way uh, by laws, uh, we know in that competitive bidding situation what the price of that target will be. It, it'll be $12,000, okay? That is, it's, it's worth $10,000 as a standalone. It's worth $12,000 if it's acquired by any of these firms. But since any of these firms can acquire them, the price will go up to 12,000. 
Now let's do the arithmetic. So if suppose you're the successful firm to acquire them, you've you bought something that's worth twelve thousand dollars, you've paid twelve thousand dollars for it. I think that's a zero economic profit. What if, on the second, other hand, there are still three firms interested in that target? Uh, one of them brings special resources and capabilities to the table that generates more value, say seventeen thousand dollars instead of twelve. Two firms bid twelve. But the winning, the firm that can generate seventeen thousand of value, a uh, value they earn, that they pay twelve thousand one dollars, roughly twelve thousand dollars for that target. Now, that successful company takes something that's worth seventeen thousand dollars, pays twelve thousand for it. That five thousand dollar difference, that's an economic profit, and it's driven by the unique resources and capabilities that that firm brings to that acquisition market. So uh, that's that, that's essentially a resource-based uh, view. It, 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 it's not a replacement for uh, uh, positioning. I once was hired by a company to give a speech to their senior management team. And normally, I'm hired to do these things uh, to do resource-based theory gigs. Right, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I was having lunch with these people, and, and before my my talk, and I and said, and I asked them about their business. And they, they explained to me that they were essentially in a two-firm oligopoly, that their firm dominated as a retail product, their firm dominated the East Coast, and the other firm dominated the West Coast. I had just purchased one of these products. It's just simply bent metal, and it cost $700. I couldn't understand it. Now I understood it, okay? And so I changed my talk. I said, you guys are in a two-firm oligopoly. Let's talk about how you maintain competitive advantage in that world as opposed to a more competitive world. So I certainly can, the, the positioning is useful in some settings, uh, but uh, as long as we're not in oligopolistic situations with high barriers to entry, the world that, uh, uh, that, that works best in the positioning world, then, then uh, resource-based logic is, is, I think, a more appropriate logic. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting you, 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 you talk about finance and strategy, right? I mean, I, I right. flip back and forth teaching those two different um, sure. subjects and, and oftentimes you have to kind of like, you know, flip your, you know, you have to, you have to do a little toggle switch in, in your head because they, they think so differently. And, and, you know, I always think of Jensen and Meckling as a, um, primarily a finance article, but it's really, right. you know, it's, it's about, it's organizational design. It's, it's, you know, sure. it's a law and economics. It's, it's a lot of stuff, but, um, but, you know, fi- people who, I, all my friends in, in finance who, you know, are big believers in efficient markets and so forth. Right. Sure. Um, they oftentimes struggle with this idea. Like if, if there are, n- if there are no positive NPV projects in the financial markets, then, then how can you in the same course just start talking about positive and negative NPV projects <laughs> in the project market? Right. I mean, if, if, if yeah. you know, there, there shouldn't be any, right. I mean, there, there shouldn't be any, every, every, every project should be zero NPV in the same way that every, you know, security is zero yeah. NPV. If you do, you do the analysis and, 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 and that's one yeah. of those areas where, in, you know, in finance, you just say, well, look, this is just the way it is. And, you yeah. know, if you understand, so, so I always tell my, my finance students, you know, the people are going into buy side or whatever. I say, Hey, you know, the best finance class that you can ever take is, is, is strategy, right? <laughs> because, you know, I mean, well, okay. 20 years ago, I used to say the best finance course you could take was the golf class, right? You know, cause you, 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 you know, that was going to be more useful than, than, than well, ACF. <laughs> but, but, but now I say, Hey, you know, you got to take a strategy class. Cause that's, if you want to understand where value comes from and you want to understand how to, and yet you still have people, you know, um, doing like traditional DCF type stuff. And it's, it's well, kind of frustrating. Well, I always tell this, but first of all, I, I don't want to be any confusion. I have enormous respect for my finance colleagues, and I, a lot of the work they do is really, really marvelous. Uh, sorry. And, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, for myself, building on finance theory has been a really important story to tell for my own development work. But here's the secret, uh, and let me d- demonstrate this secret. I, I, I have two editions of Brilliant Myers, which at, at one time was the uh, the big undergraduate or uh, big MBA uh, finance book. And one's uh, like a third edition. And um, it's, it's, these, these are really thick books, like 800 pages long. It's insane. And this 800 pages long book, and they have you gotta, one chapter. You got to fly to Europe if you want to read that one. Yeah, that's right. That's right. One chapter that's 12 pages long 
that is titled, where do positive net present value projects come from? And you know what the answer is? They don't know. Right. So in the most recent edition, I thought, well, we'll see what happens. So now it's an even bigger book. And now there are three or four chapters in the middle and all on where do positive NPV projects come from? And the answer is they don't have a theory of where NPV projects come from. And the reason they, they can't have a theory is because in order to calculate NPV, you have to assume that markets are pretty efficient. And if the, all those capital markets are efficient, then there's no, and this is consistent with my theory. If all these factor markets are were efficient, there are no profits. So the only way for profits exists is if there's some sort of competitive imperfections. Not of the kind that uh, Professor Porter would have us look at, but of the kind that are associated with heterogeneous capabilities. Now, by the way, um, I'm not the only person who recognized that. Harold Demsetz uh, wrote some articles in the early 60s that made essentially the same argument, um, that uh, he has this one line in one of his papers that says, um, you know, sometimes the reason some firms do better than other firms is because they're just better at addressing customer needs. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard to tell why they're better at addressing customer needs. Well, that's resource-based theory at its core. Uh, another way of saying this is that if you can measure and report and characterize an asset's, that, what, the way an asset creates value with precision, then it won't be a source of economic profits because it'll be perfectly priced in these markets. So, um, so yeah, I, I, the, the finance stuff has been important, but it's been important for me to also understand its limitations. Well, one of the ways, and this is flowing back into finance, is the idea that, you know, if, if, if the value of a project is a function of who owns it or the value of an opportunity is a function of who's attempting to exploit it, then, you know, at some point, the, whoever owns a financial asset, right, the function, the value of a financial asset is also a function of, of, of who owns it because in right. financial markets, um, you know, there are control premiums that vary depending on, you know, who's, who's essentially influencing the, uh, uh, the folks. And I think in your, in your, um, the great example in your, in your novel where the, the company is under threat from the private equity yes. folks, right. And, and, That's right. you know, what, what they bring to the table as is, you know, the ability to kind of presumably, uh, align the management and, and identify, you know, which managers or which, uh, which incentive schemes or organizational structures are most likely to uh, identify and exploit the uh, the opportunities that this company right, faced. Right. So it's interesting that you that you picked up on that. Um, I, I, I recently published another paper in Strategic Management Journal that um, takes that to the next logical step. And, uh, and that is the following. Um, in the, in the title of the paper is something like uh, why resource-based theories model of profit appropriation must include a stakeholder perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you, I spent 20 years arguing against stakeholders as confused as I'm not very helpful. But what I did is I, I, uh, I started bumping in companies, clients, who were taking stakeholder theory very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I can either assume they're dumb or they know something I don't know. And I'm, I'm reluctant to conclude that they're dumb because these are successful people. So I started thinking about it. And, um, and I realized this is, this is what, this is a deal that traditional shareholder primacy, this is a deal that it offers to uh, firm stakeholders. What we want you to do, I'm talking to employees and suppliers and even customers often. And here's the deal. What we want you to do we want you to work really hard. We want you to make all sorts of specific investments in our company. We want your dedication. We want your loyalty. We want your creativity. And then we're going to take all those resources and capabilities, combine with them with others, and we're going to generate economic profits that we're going to, that we're going to give to the shareholders. Right. Yep. Why, would, why would any rational stakeholder agree to that deal? That's crazy. And so I actually go through in this paper, 2018 SMJ paper, and using both transaction cost economics and incomplete contract theory, show that um, the, the, that if 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 you if you uh, if all profits are given to residual claimants, then firms will never be able to attract the kinds of specific investments they need from other stakeholders to generate those profits. Um, and so uh, now I realize that 
stakeholder issues still are difficult. I'm not pretending I've solved all the issues of stakeholder theory, but the notion that um, that all we the, all a firm has to do is maximize returns to its shareholders. If if you maximize returns to your shareholders, the way to do that is in fact by also including other stakeholders, those that provide resources that have the potential for generating economic profits, provide those resources. Uh, to those those people then provide resources to the firm that have the potential for generating generating those profits. Well, I think that I mean I think that view of, of shareholder primacy was was really built on on this assumption that you could um, construct uh, fully contingent contracts in all these other domains, right? And that you know labor law was was sufficiently well defined, and the oh, debtor creditor sure. law was sufficiently right. well defined, and you know supplier law and and you know customer law was so and, and it was so well defined that you could you know you could draft these perfect contracts, and whereas you know, in the equity relationship by its very nature was, was something that, that, you know, had to it's be an incomplete you know, contract. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but you know, we, we all know that, that, that perfect contracts are not possible in any domain really. Right. Well, go back to what I said earlier. Suppose you could write a perfect contract, then it would be perfectly priced to these competitive markets and there would be no profits. That is, if I knew for sure that my asset was worth X dollars to you, I would, ex- I would insist on X dollars. So, uh, so yeah, it is. It is in competitive imperfections of various kinds where the possibility of economic profit can be generated. The, 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 really, the only the only thing resource-based theory does, as opposed to the positioning perspective, is to suggest that those competitive imperfections have much more to do with heterogeneous capabilities than they do with oligopoly and barriers to entry. Right. And so when we think back to the positioning and, and you, I think you talked about how, you know, you, you really wanted to position this idea in contradistinction to the, the Porter notion, right. but you could have, you know, also compared it to, you know, Nelson and Winter and some other stuff. Right. Right. And, and, and I think in, in all of this, um, a, a real central uh, theme is, you know, heterogeneous capabilities are not um, exogenous, right? If, if they were, if they were just exogenous and, you know, I, I use the example in class of like, you know, Hey, um, <laughs> There's a huge uh, opportunity, you know, in to be an NBA center, right? If I'm going to apply like a Porter analysis, I'm going to be like, wow, you know, that that looks like a pretty good industry to be in. You know, if I can be the NBA center, you know, like, like, you know, the only problem is I just happen to, you know, lack the uh, the, <laughs> the, the the resources and the capabilities well, to to do that. But 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 that's that's assuming like a, a exogeneity. But in in yeah. in practice, right? I mean, firms are 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 creating resources and, yeah. and capabilities, and and they're they're going to orient their investment towards the creation of those that sure. have the capability of being you know long lasting and and can't be appropriated. Yeah, that that path dependent nature, that reinvesting yourself, that's the that's the work that, that David Teese and his colleagues have done on on dynamic capabilities, which has been a wonderful extension of resource based theory. Uh, in some really, really powerful ways. I totally agree. Uh, yeah, it's in, totally endogenous. But, but I'm not totally. There could be exogenous shocks, yeah. no doubt. But uh, uh, most of it is endogenous. Right. And so, you know, if you from a from a welfare economics perspective, I think, you know, you would argue that firms spend probably, they invest too much in, um, you know, capabilities that, that, that are defensible and, uh, and, and not enough in those that are, you know, uh, well, uh, appropriable. I, actually, actually, I think it's more subtle than that. Let's take three things. So, first of all, the positioning perspective. Uh, I have a, a former uh, colleague and mentor, Bill Ochi, who refused to teach Porter uh, Porter's ideas in class because he says, "I don't want to be in the business of teaching MBAs how to create monopolies. That's bad for society." <laughs> okay, so that's one story. Uh, resource-based theory is actually. Um, um, is usually consistent, not always, but usually consistent with social welfare in the sense that firms are heterogeneous in their capabilities, uh, their ability to uh, sell products that exploit those capabilities in markets depend on demand for those products. So if both buy and seller voluntarily agree to, uh, 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 to buy this product that's somehow special, then that price, the profits that generated is actually consistent with both the interests of those, of those parties and that's consistent with social welfare. Uh, but the notion that, um, that firms uh, spend too much money on um, 
developing resources and capabilities that are costly to imitate as opposed to more generic ones. I, I don't think that follows necessarily. Uh, it, for example, um, it, 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 if, if, if I say if, if I try to implement a public policy that says firms should invest most of their efforts on developing generic capabilities, then what kind of products and services are we going to get out of that world? Well, we're going to get generic products and services. Now, if we lived in the Soviet Union, where everyone was supposed to have the same exact preferences, then that's not a problem at all. But in real life, there's a great deal of heterogeneity in preferences uh, uh, on the consumer side. And so, uh, and then, and, and so actually some consumers are willing to pay extra money to get access to products that are developed by firms that have specialized skills. It's not just consumers, but uh, this happens in B&B as well. And in uh, this is the business transactions as well. So, um, I, I, I will also say one other, and this is a very subtle distinction that I almost, I almost never talk about, so great question. Um, some people think about the problem of uh, investing in resources as a two-part problem. As part one is invest in the resource, and part two is invest in barriers to imitation. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think of it that way. It can, it can be that way, but more likely it is that the act of investing in a resource or capability is itself the source of the very invitation because the act of investing in these resource and capabilities happens over time in socially complex cultures and settings that are very costly to imitate by their nature. So there isn't a resource investment and then a barrier that you have to then invest in separately. In fact, they are often uh, invested in simultaneously. I'll give you an extreme example of this. Um, I, I get this a, a, a lot. Uh, uh, firms will invest in technology, and then and they will patent the technology, and they'll say, "See, I invest in the resources, the technology, and then I patent to protect it." And I ask them, "How long will it take before your patent is imitated?" Well, we have data on that, except for a couple of industries, specialty chemicals and pharmaceuticals, at least some pharmaceuticals. Imitation happens quickly, but what is difficult to imitate is not the, not the technology and protected by a patent, but the innovativeness that enables you to develop the technology. The innovativeness is the capability that is socially complex and path dependent, and thus more likely to be a source of sustained competitive advantage than a technology protected by a patent. When you get the patent, you, you tell the whole world what's special about your technology. How long is it going to take them to design around it? In most industries, not long. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree that the, the defensibility is not an afterthought or, uh, you know, come in later. I mean, but, but it does, it does because these investors look forward and reason back. I mean, they're thinking very carefully about which of these investments are protectable. I mean, certainly the, the venture capitalists, um, I don't think you get two, you know, two slides in to your, to your pitch deck before you're talking about the, you know, the, 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 the moats that you're going to put around it. And well, it's, it, it may be intellectual property or it could be, you know, other kinds of switching costs or, you know, anything that, that's, that's, that's going to create lock in. Yeah. Those are all, those are all reasonable things to do. Uh, and certainly have a huge impact on the value of the investment. Um, but um, I, I, I'll tell you the next, next extreme. When I work with entrepreneurial firms who, think they have a protection because they have a patent, mm -hmm. only discover that they usually don't. I say, you're going you're gonna to lose, you're going you're gonna to lose the, the proprietary, proprietary nature of this technology. It may take a while, it may take two years, three years, but it's going to be gone. So let's make money in the process. Let's license it. Let's, let's, since it's going to happen, let's make money on when it's going to happen. Um, the thing that you're not going to lose well, the thing that is harder to imitate, you can lose it if you, or you make mistakes from a management point of view, but what's harder to imitate is the, the socially complex, path-dependent, mm -hmm. causing ambiguous stuff like innovativeness, creativity, an ability to work to more effectively as a team. You know, that stuff, that stuff is hard to buy and sell. Uh, even if you bought the entire firm, you change the context and that can actually destroy the thing that you end up buying. Um, so, uh, yeah, so those are the things that I think are more likely to be sources of, uh, costly imitation and thus sustained competitive advantage. And, and so the, the causal ambiguity and the kind of complexity, I mean, 
to what extent is that endogenous, right? I mean, I, I when I look at, um, you know, the, the extent to which you can actually uh, protect IP through legal means, I mean, it kind of gives you a, a greater incentive to um, not worry as much about opacity, right? I mean, when you think about countries where you don't have um, a, a great deal of, of, of legal protection against appropriation, right? Uh, where, the, where, the com- where the government can come in and nationalize or your suppliers can take away your, you know, or your, your contract manufacturer. You see a completely different industrial organization of, of the society, right? Where you have, you know, Koretsu's or you have, um, you know, large family owned firms and, and, you know, you just, and, and so there's just way more opacity uh, in, inside those, those organizations, right? Well, it's, that's, that's a fair observation. Uh, and so that structure of ownership can have an impact on that inevitability question. I have to tell you, I, I was uh, visiting a, a well-known Chinese um, uh, computer company. And I asked, what's your biggest strategic problem? And they said, it's all these companies ripping off our technology, which I thought was just a tiny bit ironic. Um, the thing that's interesting is that even in settings where um, – there are not these patent and technology safeguards. IP is not well established, those kinds of things. Some firms make more money than other firms. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can do it in monopoly, but you'd also do it by being really good at meeting customer needs in a way that is difficult for others to, to imitate. And by the way, I do think that, the, the in, for example, in the, the Keiretsu in Japan, um, the groups in, uh, in Korea, the large large family businesses in India, a lot of those are to try to keep the secret sauce within the boundaries of the family or within the boundaries of the of the relationships. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So I was wondering, you know, um, I think when you when you're writing these these uh, you know back in the '90s and so forth, and we we're thinking yeah. about what made for a um, you know a, a resource or capability. Um, you know, those things were very different in, in many ways than, than today. I mean, I think you know, now we talk about um, networks, we talk about ecosystems, we oh, talk yeah. about data. Sure. I mean, I, I teach a whole course on data strategy where the, the entire sure. point of the class is like, you know, proprietary data is, is your is your is your key resource, right? Like, if, you know, yeah. and and if if you if you go to a VC and you and you don't have a proprietary data strategy, then they're just going to laugh you out of the room. Sure, um, absolutely. So to, to what extent, I mean, firms now are, are relying on, on different kinds of, of, of heterogeneity to, to survive. Um, sure. How are but you seeing, did, yeah. It doesn't really change the, uh, the underlying theory remains the same. It's application changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, there's a misunderstanding, uh, and probably my fault because I wasn't clear enough of this when I wrote it in 1984, uh, which is a long time ago. But, um, but um, it's clear that firms don't have to, own these assets mm-hmm. in order to control you, just, you gave examples of where ownership could be helpful but it's not a, it's not a requirement uh, in fact in the 2018 paper uh in us and data much earlier it's all about managers getting access to resources from a variety of of stakeholders in their ecosystem ecosystem is another word for stakeholders just to be frank okay um and so uh and so i make that explicit and the whole task is to get these independent entities to make specific investments it can be co-specialized within a single firm to be a source of economic profit that the, the, this whole the, a lot of this is a deeply problematic though because you think about it with employees you can't own employees you never could own it well you used to but slavery thank goodness is out well, although it's still practice um and so it's illegal to own employees, and yet employees provide some of the most critical resources that are necessary to generate uh, competitive advantage and economic profit. And so uh, extending that logic, you don't need to own your suppliers for those suppliers to make specific investments in you if, you're, if you can convince them that they're going to be willing to share some of the profits that those specific investments generate back with them. They're interested in working with you to get access to the profits, but you also have to be able to demonstrate you will you will share those profits. If you if you rip them off, they they won't join again, and you have a very short entity. 
Yeah. Right. Well, you know, where we, where we, where I sit here in, in the Bay Area, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the average life expectancy of an, of an employee is, is, sure. you know, 14 months, they say. And, and, yeah. you know, I, I, that, no, that's like, an I, interesting I, problem. That data is obviously, um, a bit, uh, distorted because it's, you know, a lot of it's just the fact that so companies are, are young and they're growing very rapidly. So, so it doesn't, it's not the expected, it's not really the life expectancy of a new hire. It's kind of, you know, it's probably, that's probably considerably longer, but, but, you know, these, these companies are, well, you know, they, they're, they're forced to standardize some things. They're forced to, um, you know, figure out very quickly how to get the most out of the employees. So, uh, so let, very, very oh, that, okay. Right. That, okay. There's two points that set last yeah. point you made is absolutely correct. So the first point is uh, we have, for some reason, I don't fully understand for some historical reason, many firms have gone away from, uh, trying to guarantee employment for employees to instead of guaranteeing employability, which means yeah. what we do is we'll give you experiences that enhance your general capital mm -hmm. that will make you value when you go somewhere else. Think about that for just a second. Yeah. We're going to make you value so you can go somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. You can't extract economic profits from that general human capital. However, what you can do is some firms may be more skilled at attracting building, attracting employees, building teams, and creating value with those teams quickly in anticipation of the fact they'll be always turning over uh, because of whatever social norms that might exist. But um, so, uh, so long-term employment is not the only way that you can generate human, uh, value with human capital. But, you, but you, if you can get individuals to, to come to your firm, make specific investments mm -hmm. with others, in a co-specialized way that can regenerate profits, then actually the team can disperse and the underlying technology or strategy was, yeah. that was chosen and implemented can continue on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a profound shift. I mean, the the, the, the idea of, you know, employee lock-in was, was just such a essential part oh. of strategy, right? You know, you, you oh, want people that, to, and, and you that, still that, see it in some parts of the world where, you know, if you're sorry. a, if you're a Nissan guy, like you're not going to like go to Toyota, right? And no, no, but, no. <laughs> but, but, but here, I mean, um, and in your book, you actually, it, it, I, don't, I don't want to be a spoiler alert. Spoiler here, but, alert. Spoiler alert. I know where you're going. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, one of the characters who, who is a, um, you know, management consultant winds up taking up, taking on an executive position with the, with the, with the client, right? Which is right. not uncommon. And, not and, uncommon. And, and of course, uh, the, the, our novice in, in the novels is kind of shocked that um, this is seen as something to celebrate rather than, than something to be uh uh, concerned about because this person has, you know, invest, they've invested a lot in this consultant and then boom, you know, she's gone. gone. So, but see, uh, in the consulting world, as you know, the reason that the smart consulting firms are not concerned about losing consultants to clients is those just become the next generation of clients for the firm. So uh, they, they have to build that relationship. The relationship continues, even though the hired, uh, the position yeah. as employee no longer exists. So yeah, I, I think that it's an interesting it's an interesting problem. Um, I, I so I I spent a lot of time in the 1980s with Hewlett Packard Corporation, and you know they actually really worked hard to have stable employment relationships. They they, they would keep people on for long. They they avoided layoffs, those kinds of things. Uh, they're no longer I, the HP has evolved so much that it's hard to even know what's left over. It's still called HP, but uh, certainly that has changed a lot. But it, it, all it does is it changes the changes the task that that firms have to engage in in order to generate economic profits with their human capital. They don't have the luxury of having people make long term specific investments. You have to make them quickly. Yeah. You have to expect people to do it. One thing I would look for, for example, and I have a paper on this as well in SMJ with some co-authors that says that um, one thing to look for is the, the willingness of people to, in their previous jobs to make firm-specific investments, their willingness mm -hmm. and their ability. That actually is a – spotting that capability in your employee seems to me to be extremely important. The whole employee lock-in, that, that has a very monopolistic mm -hmm. slavery yeah. ass feel to the whole, the whole thing. That's not going to work today. Well, I think what you're referring to is kind of looking for people that act like owners, right? I mean, well, you know, exactly right. Because looking, because remember, if if they are, if they make specific investments that have profit generating, the only reason they would make specific investments that have profit generating potential is because they are in fact treated like owners and receiving residual claims. 
from that. Exactly right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that you, 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 you allude to in a lot of your work is, is the, um, kind of analogy with, with, uh, with, you know, the, the work on routines and, uh, and how, sure. you know, routines, uh, in, at least in an evolutionary economic story, right. You know, routines are these, are like the unit of analysis and then, sure. and, and they kind of, um, you know, replicate if they're, if they're effective and, and sure. so forth. And, and they're kind of, they're the, you know, they're the gene equivalent. Yeah, except that they, you know, they rep they're 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 more like viruses in the sense that they, <laughs> they, they, they they replicate within a host more effectively than they they get trans transmitted across hosts. Fair um, point. Fair point. And uh, so, how do you how do you how does your your thinking kind of line up with the with that whole body of research, which is which is related? Well, I mean, certainly, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Nelson and Winter and evolutionary economics generally, and certainly evolutionary theories applied. The firms. Evolutionary theories have some inherent lim- limitations from a practical point of view. They're non teleological, so you can't use them to make predictions. You can describe what could happen, but you can't, of all the possible outcomes, you can't say this is the one that will, is most likely. Um, and so uh, they have some of those limitations. Uh, but um, uh, the notion of a routine and a capability are very closely linked. Um, in some ways, evolutionary theory is about, um, let me say this, non, non-purpose driven, non-motivated changes in uh, capabilities over time. Whereas resource-based theory is much more about, okay, what do we have? It's much more, it's clearly teleological, it's goal-oriented. What do we have? How can we modify it? How can we use that to get access to new capabilities, human capital, or other kinds of capital, that, where we can create more value than anyone else and therefore generate economic profits. Uh, and so uh, while I see a lot of similarities between the concept of a, of a routine and, and the notion of a capability, the way those are used in two theories is, is, is I think, quite different. Right. And I, I mean, I do think that the kind of the boundary of the firm story is, 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 is important as well. Um, sure, sure. And, uh, you know, where, how, how do these, if, if you, you have a good idea, you have a good routine, you have a good uh, way of doing things, you have a capability, right? You know, you want, you want to scale it. You want to, you know, get the most out of it. Just like if sure. you have a, sure. you know, the, the metaphor I use in, in, you know, the very, well, I'm trying to explain like super, super simple, you know, uh, sure. resource ideas. You know, if, if, if you're, if you've got some crude oil and you've got, you know, exclusive access to crude oil, right? You don't want to be throwing away half of the crude oil, right? And you want to make sure. your jet fuel, you want to make your... Get, your, your, get scale so you can take advantage of all the crude oil because you have this Yeah, I'm on Facebook and I, and I know, sure. you know, I know this about you and I'm not monetizing it like, hey, you know, I, I got to find out. And so all the kind of adjacencies that, that a firm goes into are, sure. you know, often ways of... of of, of leveraging those, those capabilities in the same way you'd want to leverage excess, you know, production capacity or warehouse sure. capacity or whatever. So, um, so, 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 see, so okay. it's interesting. Um, two comments. Uh, first of all, clearly in terms of a diversi- diversification, diversity of operations and adjacencies, uh, resource based theory says, um, say, so, uh, one action that if you're in a current business and have a competitive advantage that business based on capabilities that you control, um, an adjacency is defined as a related business where you can take advantage of at least some of those, those um, resources and capabilities in a, in a, in a related business. What that's what relatedness means. Uh, what it tells you is there's some things that are likely to be more likely to be sources of competitive advantage across diversified operations and others. So for example, um, uh, years ago, I used to teach this case. I, I, I won't mention the details because it's very embarrassing. It's very old anyway. Uh, and this company was trying to justify why I wanted to do a particular acquisition. And it says, there are two clear synergies in this, uh, between us and this target. Okay, cool. It's a diversification group. Cool. The first one is, we have excess warehouse capacity. They need warehouses. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm thinking, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking that excess warehouse capacity is not valuable, rent. well, it could be valuable, it's not rare, it costs to imitate, and it could be in some settings, but this is not unusual, this would be unusual. The second synergy was, they need money, and we have money. Well, on that basis, they should acquire me, because I need money, 
And it, it, this is crazy. This sounds so, like one of my. This sounds like some of the finance, some of the final projects that I get in my. Oh, in my yes. So it's class. like oh, seriously. Now, on the other hand, if you tell me that you have uh, uh, an, inc- an incredible capability for bringing resources together to create very innovative product technologies, and there's another business over there that currently doesn't have that operation, that, that kind of capability, but could. Now, that's a diversification move, I understand. Um, so that's the first point. The second point has to do with, with the boundaries of the firm. Um, and this is new thinking. I'm not, it's not, I'm not settled on this entirely, but I have this feeling that from a strategic point of view, that the boundary of the firm is actually not a very interesting question. Hmm. What really is the question is, how do I assemble the resources that I need in a co-specialized way to generate economic profits? Now, um, uh, some of those may be inside the boundary of the firm. Some of those are never going to be inside the boundary of the firm. Um, and so, well, uh, well, I totally understand why the government is very interested in understanding how to define the boundary of the firm for tax reasons. I get it. Why the accountants would be interested in that. Creditors not, are interested. Yeah, yeah, creditors are interested. I know. I get all that. But from a strategic point of view, uh, whether it's inside or outside the boundary of the firm, can be in a, is is always dependent on to what to what extent are we able to get specialized investments of the kind necessary to generate economic profits. If we can do that across a firm boundary, then fine. If we can't, then we bring them in in house. It's a slightly different story than transaction cost economics, which is not about how do we create rents from those boundary decisions. It is more about how do we prevent opportunism from the rents that are created. Uh, across the boundary. So those are slightly different stories, but like I'm, I'm working on a paper right now that tries to articulate that a little bit more uh, precisely. Well, you know, I think that's an, that's an important direction. And, and, uh, uh, I, and hope so. I, you know, I think, and I think you know, increasingly as we think about platform business models, I mean, sure. Platform yeah, business models, they're, they're not new. It, it, it's, no. it's, but, uh, um, but their, their, their prevalence is, is, has made everybody Shh. think about think about them and think seriously about them. And, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden we can look back and see other businesses and say, Hey, wait, those, those are, those are platforms. Um, well, if you think about it, yeah, your platforms, ecosystems, network industries, it's going, all, all that language is describing the same phenomena that, that, um, the ability to generate economic profit is no longer, um, held within the boundaries of a, of a particular firm. It's, it can be, it can be involved co-specialized relationships across large numbers of different actors. And so, uh, yeah, that seems to me uh, much more reasonable. It is, in fact, the case um, if you adopt a notion that a firm has to own all the assets that could be a potential source of, of economic profits, then um, uh, to, for opportunism or some other reasons, mm-hmm. uh, to pr- protect it from imitation, the result of that is... Uh, really a very low flexibility. You're, you're fully committed because mm-hmm. the cost of getting rid of all that stuff, it can be very high. So uh, it, just maintain multiple relationships, still, still inducing people to make specific investments, stakeholders make specific investments in your company so that you can generate profits uh, and that, that, that are then shared with those stakeholders. Uh, that's as stable as uh, 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 having everyone inside the boundary of the firm. Uh, and but still is more flexible. Yeah, no, I think I mean flexibility is is you know it's it's pretty pretty important today, particularly. Sure, I mean, with the the average life expectancy of a company on the S and P has gone from like sixty years down to down down to twelve years. And so that's right. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm I'm kind of talking to legacy companies, I, I feel like I feel like that one of these um uh you know doctors in in a uh, in, in a cancer ward, right? I mean it. Like, do you, you know, they might bring you in and say, Hey, you know, how do we extend our life by, you know, a few more years? And, and every now and then, you know, you, you have to tell a patient, listen, maybe you should just maybe spend some time with the, spend some time with the grandkids and, you know, right. like see right. the world because, you know, why would you want to get on the, uh, you know, chemo drip for that, spend the last year of your life on the chemo drip. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, and, um, even when legacy companies go away. And they don't, they don't go away all at once, typically. But when they go away over time, 
large uh, companies from, with long histories. The resources and capabilities of the company don't go away. They get re, they get re, redistributed across the economy, and people who understand about how to do high quality manufacturing because they worked for many years at a GE plant, um, and then the plant closes or is sold off. That capability doesn't go away. People learn to reapply it in new ways. Another well, transaction bit. cost. I don't want to pretend that these are not trivial. Uh, people's lives are interrupted. Those kinds of things, but. From the overall point of view of the overall efficiency of the economy, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's not a disaster. Well, I mean, there are some non-reversibilities, right? I mean, there, the, 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 the specific routines that exist within sure. that organization, right? But, um, but I was wondering, you know, in evolutionary biology, there's, there's, a, there's always this, this discussion about, you know, is there, is there a, is there a gene that that controls the mutation rate? You know, like, and and does that exist independent of the other genes, right? Um, and and organizations that have the capability of kind of changing their capabilities, this sure. this seems to be uh, you know increasingly important. And I think in in you know in your in your novel, uh, you know this this comes up, right? There there's a there's a um, there's an inertia. There's 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 an organizational uh, uh, factors which uh, mitigate against uh, companies yeah, if, acquiring if, if new capabilities. Some people's self-interest do not see change inside organizations. Absolutely, right. And so, how does it, how does an organization develop a um, you know a, 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 the, the capability of 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 evolving its capabilities, mm-hmm. so to speak? Well, if I if I knew the answer to that question, I wouldn't tell you because I'd just sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, listen, I, you know, um, I, several thoughts come to my mind. One of them is that um, I, I'm, I'm, one of the projects I'm working on right now is with a, a, a former CEO, a friend of mine. And we are um, we're tackling the question of how do you change an organization's culture? Mm-hmm. Now, a, 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 a Culture is a set of values and beliefs, stories that are told about innovation and creativity, uh, performance, efficiency, management relationships, all those things that make up a culture. And everyone knows, I think that it's been demonstrated conclusively that, that organizational culture can have a huge impact on performance. And um, in some of the ways we've already talked about, sort of uh, gathering people together and, and helping them realize uh, extra value by working together in a particular organizational culture. But suppose you're in a company that has a sucky culture. Right? It's just mm-hmm. a disaster, it's culture. It may have other advantages that allow it to survive, but its organization culture is a real disaster. So in order to grow and go to the next level, what do you do? Um, and you know, uh, there aren't really good answers to that question in the literature. Uh, many years ago, um, I was contacted by a firm in Silicon Valley uh, and asked if I, was, if I would be willing to help them uh, changed their culture. Um, they had a major competitor at, that had a very um, enabling, ennobling culture. And they had just finished a six-month study that had shown that their culture was risk-averse, punished risk-taking, and thus they didn't get any innovation. By the way, it took them six months. Anyone in the Valley knew this in five minutes. I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. come on, six months. So sure. that's Was it a university by any What's chance? That? Just Was it a university by any chance? I'm not going to mention names, obviously. I'm <laughs> just so. checking. I mean, because, uh, you know. So, so anyway, this, this, this company, they came to me and they said, uh, what we want to do is we want you to hire, uh, we want to hire you to get rid of our old culture and build a new culture just like our major competitor. And we should to do that in six months. I said, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> you know, I don't think it, it works that way. So we are actually exploring how, we, we, we've talked to individuals who've actually changed at least some important elements of their culture. Um, and um, and, we're, and we're, we're trying to understand how they do that. And so this is really only, this is really about developing a dynamic capability and how that's done. The, the, the thing we're foc- excuse me, focusing on is, the, and this shouldn't surprise you given that I wrote a novel, um, it's, it's about uh, changing the stories that are told mm-hmm. inside the organization. And they do that by, um, by implementing 
by engaging in activities that are designed to challenge the status quo and become sort of a story within the firm. Um, if we have time, I give you some examples. But uh, so we're actually exploring that problem in some detail right now, trying to understand how to make how to create a firm that can actually change who it is. Uh, I'll, I'll also grant sometimes the best thing to do is let a firm die uh, because the change might be so hard that it is not not practical. Mm -hmm. But uh, and other times uh, we we have. We've just finished interviewing 50 CEOs former and former CEOs. About two-thirds of them uh, can describe how they engage in activities that have the effect of changing their culture in the organization. Um, a third never tried or tried and failed. Those are also really interesting to hear. Uh, and and, uh, and we're beginning to see what, what can happen with, with cultural change like that. Well, when I, when I remember back to when I was first introduced to this concept of, of kind of core competencies, right? Um, sure. This was at a time when you had companies like uh, Immer Beatrice Foods and, and sure. like these, you know, they, I forget, they make like orange juice and bowling balls and, you know, they had like, <laughs> you know, movie theaters and outboard engines and like, you know, you'd look at these companies and you're like, well, what the heck is going on with this company, right? I mean, you know. And Coca-Cola was, I think it was owned by, you know, a movie studio at some, I mean, it was like all this crazy stuff happening. And, um, and, and, and that's kind of led to the breakups. It led to a lot of the LBOs and, and, sure. and uh, stuff like that. And, and it was really all about these kind of pure plays, but I think we're, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing a whole new generation of, of, you might think of as like new conglomerates because, because remember the argument back in those days was, Hey, if you're good at management, you're good at management, right? If your core competency is to evaluate projects, then you can evaluate projects. And, 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 and then that got killed, but now we're, we see it reborn because, you know, if you talk to someone at Sequoia or at, um, you know, Kleiner Perkins, they'll say, well, you know, I'm good at evaluating projects. Or if you talk to someone at, at, a, um, you know, KKR or whatever, they'll say, well, we're good at, you know, managing kind of companies. And, and then when you look at Amazon, I mean, is there really anything that Amazon can't do, right? I mean, there, <laughs> there it seems to me like they they actually are a realization of this idea that you can have a core competency in the area of just you know running a company, right? And, and running so a process. I, I, I did, I, so there are there are I disagree with you on Amazon, by the way. So, but because um, I think their core competency is uh, is distribution, and then they have a second business that's called. Uh, AWS that actually funds their investment in distribution. So, um, but um, and whether that's the right way to fund the distribution business, I don't know. That's a diff also a different question. But uh, the, the, but but uh, the uh, venture capital firms and uh, private equity firms. Um, it's it's an interesting challenge. Um, first of all, they, they they usually are not trying to realize operational economies in scope. Right, so to re like a common R and D facility across the businesses they own, or right. a common sales force, or those operational details are often quite difficult to do. Mm -hmm. uh, they really specialize in um, evaluating not just projects, but certain kinds of projects and certain kinds of firms. Uh, let me give you an example. I had a client that I worked with, a fabulous company, enjoyed it enormously. It was a small cap, uh, mid cap company uh, in a very mature marketplace. Uh, they had 80% uh, of the market, well, 70 to 80% of the market in the United States, um, just thrown off cash, just thrown off cash. And so the first thing we did, of course, is we uh, evaluated their dividend policy and their stock buyback policy, and we made the adjustments so that it was that they were right where they should be with respect to those two activities. Uh, and it was just still thrown off cash, positive, positive cash flow. And, uh, and so we then uh, took them and we restructured them. It took two or three years, but we restructured them into a multi-divisional structure that became a platform for acquisitive uh, for um, acquisitions, but of a very specific kite in a very special industry um, and where there, there were clear capability advantages. And they did three of those acquisitions and, and they all worked. They all generated even more cash. Uh, and and uh, I and I said, what's the end of this? And I, the end of it is, you're going to get acquired by a private equity company, who's going to take all that cash and use it. And that's the way you're going to realize the full value. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the private equity company, that happened. Uh, the private equity company uh, has done some additional acquisitions. But they have not realized the full synergies, but they put really good, really good controls in place. That capability, it seems to me, they're betting on that capability to generate the economic value from the acquisition. Uh, we'll see if this happens in this case, in this particular case, but that is the general story uh, about what a venture capital firm can bring to the table, what a, what a private equity firm can bring to the table. Because they're, they're going to own, they're going to own orange juice and bowling balls, mm -hmm. but do they have a distinct advantage in managing the allocation of resources in particular kinds of diversified or particular kinds of diversified portfolios? That's the question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have seen a tendency. You can you're closer to this than I am, probably, in venture capital for firms to begin to specialize in certain mm -hmm. kinds of industries that you have uh, the biotech VCs you have. I was on the board of a VC that I was in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, it's kind of a VC that was had a geographic emphasis on Midwest technologies and companies. And so, it, so I think I, you begin to see that kind of specialization. Uh, and, and also in private equity, you see similar kinds of focus on retail operations or restaurants have seen um, mm -hmm. some uh, um, Effectively, uh, very similar to private equity firms, uh, sort of specializing in buying and consolidating restaurant chains. Uh, yeah, no, there's, I, there's I understand all that. Yeah, there's definitely some of that, but there's also you know general purpose VCs that I guess they, they what they, they really specialize in is fundraising, right? <laughs> I mean, P perhaps, perhaps that's actually a very good point. Um, that would be a, a financial capital market inefficiency yeah. that they're exploiting, that is a little unusual. But the reason that uh, they might be able to do that is because. They have a unique history of being able mm -hmm. to generate money with that capital. Therefore, it's easier for them exactly. to get access to that capital. Exactly right. It's a big barriers to entry there. Um, yeah. So there's you know, invitation, I, not entry, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I want well, to I want to um, kind of wrap things up and and sure. get back to you know. By the way, this has been you you advertise yourself as uh, not silent. This has been. Probably the most integrated conversation I've had in a long time. So thank you very much. Oh, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's great. Um, uh, so the you know at the end of your novel, I think you you know you you, you wax philosophical a little bit and look. I mean, you you work with companies, but you also work with students. I mean, you're 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 in academia. You you've trained up you know a couple generations of of business leaders and um, and and I think you, you I'm know, actually having some trouble hearing you. Sorry, you seem to be great in there all of a sudden. So you, you've 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 kind of helped educate a couple of generations of business leaders, uh -huh. and 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 I think that you you have some interesting insight into what what makes for a good strategic thinker, right? What makes for a good leader, and and it's really, uh -huh. you know, you have one character that's a PhD in chemistry, right, in in your your book, and then you have this other person who I think feels a little insecure about his lack of expertise, but 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 at the end of the day, right, there there is an an, an expertise that you can acquire in, in in thinking and in asking questions and in manipulating frameworks and, and matching it, and kind of mixing the inductive and the deductive. Could could you just talk a little bit about like what what is it that you need to have in order to kind of you know see the see the big picture and and, and sure. drill in when you need to? So um, so uh, I teach all the analytical skills that you teach to the MBA students. Um, the fact that I can write a textbook and summarize those analytical skills suggests to me that those analytical skills by themselves are not a source of economic profits. That is, they should diffuse pretty quickly. And I think they have diffused quickly. In the same way that I, I tell my students, you know, just because you can calculate an, M present, an MPV, a present value on some cash flow, doesn't make you particularly valuable to your companies. I mean, seriously, you put the numbers in the chimpanzee, you can hit the button. Uh, not that complicated. So, um, so I, I, for me, when I think about leadership and strategic leadership in particular, you got you have to know the technical stuff. You have to know the models. But that's only a source of competitive parity. The things that are that distinguish the 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 companies that I've worked in that seem to be unusually good are much softer much softer skills like humility, willingness to learn, um, 
I, I gave a talk on this at, uh, at a recent academic meeting, and I think some people thought I was crazy. Uh, but I, I, the title of my t- talk was Love in Corporations. Uh, and this is based on my experience of companies who are trying to address really tough, tough problems, so company survival problems. Mm-hmm. And, and the difference between firms that are able to make that work and firms that are not able to make those changes is that the people who work for the CEO in the successful firm they believe that he loves them, mm-hmm. not in some perverse, gross, gross way, but in, mm-hmm. in a sense of that he cares for their well-being as much as he cares for his own well-being. And, I think, and I they think will people do in the mil- anything people in the military would say the same. I think people in the military would say the same thing, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's where I first saw it was in, in a military operation. You see this. Uh, these guys are doing impossible things together. They will literally die for their leader. And And... And uh, and that's just a remarkable thing. And so, uh, and, and so, if you ask me, how do I create that kind of leader? Uh, that's a hard problem. I don't know. There's no algorithm for creating that. But I do know that from a selection point of view, from a selection of CEO point of view, you know, I need decisiveness. I need the ability to integrate lots of information. I need the ability to see the big picture. But the ability to to create a team of individuals that have that sense of commitment to you and to the purpose, to find that broader, more general purpose for the organization. Yeah, that sounds to me like a source of competitive advantage mm-hmm. that's really hard to imitate. And, uh, and so if, if I was to give advice to people, I would be uh, about their careers, the young people that come to me and ask where they should work. I, I say, go your first job, your first two, two jobs, it's not about the money, although you need to get paid. It's about putting yourself in a position where you can observe someone like that mm-hmm. and, and, and learn from their mentorship so that someday when the time comes, not just when you're CEO, but even at middle management level, you can provide that same kind of thoughtful and powerful support. So. Well, that's great. I think we, we need to, you know, when I look back in 1991 and, and they, they, they had to tack on this, this course called, um, you know, uh, business policy and, and it was a new thing. Maybe, maybe we'll see a course called, uh, love and it will be tacked on to the, to the core. Uh, an interesting idea. An interesting <laughs> and, idea. And it too will be, have a, have a, uh, have a Jay Barney article, uh, right in the, in the heart of it. So, uh, so look, it's been great talking to you, Jay. I yeah, appreciate you taking the time. Way. Yeah. So everybody remember, you know, if you want a really great intro to strategy, there's a bunch of books out there, you know, grab the textbook. And if you really are looking for something to read on that plane, you know, definitely uh, grab the the book on, you know, what you didn't learn in business school, which I thought was fantastic. So thanks so much, Jay. Appreciate All right, it. Thank you. Talk to you later. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 